Guys, let's welcome Jared from Head PE here to NewPodNotFest.com. Jared, how are we doing today? I'm doing good, bro. Getting ready for tour. I have a tour that le uh, leaves Thanksgiving Day. Nice. And uh, yeah, with the first show uh, in Idaho Falls the day after Thanksgiving. Nice. When you when you're out touring and you're you're out touring on a holiday, do you do anything special related to said <laughs> holiday? And I'll give you a quick story. My first tour I did with Primer, as we talked uh, that I, I toured in Primer Fifty Five, we yeah. we were out on tour on Thanksgiving and we stopped at like a Denny's and everybody ordered their cheeseburgers or whatever, and I ordered the turkey platter and everyone gave me shit and I'm like, dude, it's fucking Thanksgiving. I'm gonna have yeah, a Thanksgiving meal, that. you know. <laughs> I'm homesick. What the yeah. what the heck's going on here? <laughs> no, dude, you know, um, I we were talking about it and it seems like we're spending most Thanksgivings not at home. You mm -hmm. know, I don't know if you guys know what that's like if you tour, but yeah. So generally we're not home for Thanksgiving, uh, but I'll be home, but everybody else will be away from home because mm -hmm. we're meeting here. I live in uh, Eagle, Idaho, so we're oh, nice. meeting here to start the tour. But, you know, as far as rituals on tour, um, you know what? I'll try to get the fellas together and go out to have like a, a, a Thanksgiving br a brunch or whatever, but it doesn't seem to ever work out. Everybody's got their <laughs> doing their own thing. <laughs> what took you to uh, what, what took you to Idaho? That was going to be my oh, question. <laughs> I met my girl here at the knitting factory in Boise 22 years ago. Nice. Um, nice. Coming up on December 4th will be uh, 22 years ago that I, I met my girl. Yeah. So yes. that's what Congrats. brought me here. She lived with me for a little bit in Huntington Beach and SoCal. But ultimately, I relocated here for cheaper real estate. And then, you know, she has her family uh, foundation here as well. So, oh, wow. That's, I mean, that's got to be a change. Dude. I mean, I'm in Woodland Hills, man. I couldn't imagine being like, yeah. So then I just moved from Woodland Hills to Idaho. I mean, like, that's, <laughs> that's going to be well, some kind of culture shock. Yeah. yeah it's man. culture shock, exactly what it was 18 years ago when I moved here. I was just like, <laughs> what the fuck? Like, well, especially, I mean, you're talking you know, I live from the airport. Right. I mean, you're talking 18 years ago. Was that 05? I mean, you know, like, fuck, when I was on OzFest 2000, I remember being in Dallas and people at the laundromat thought I had been in prison just because I had like three tattoos <laughs> on my arm. You know, like, I can't imagine what right. Idaho in 2005 must have been like when you got there. They're probably like, I'm sorry, what? Who, who are you? What's going on? Yeah. Well, you know, I think I, I was more less concerned with what people thought of me than I was, you know, about what I thought about the new place I was living. Right. Yeah, for <laughs> you sure. know what I'm saying? But that must have been intense, though. Just what a, that's that's such a night and day kind of move. Fucking it really crazy. is. But you know what? I'm kind of a like hermit live under a rock type of guy who's just, you know, I have a studio at home and just kind of I'm not really a social type of guy anyway. So the only the biggest trip to me was like, whoa, we live how far from the airport type and shit like that. But <laughs> right. now I'm, I'm, I'm used to it, you know, and, and when you're in a band that's touring, it's less about where you live. Right. Yeah, I guess so. That's a good point, too. <laughs> well, the one thing kind of going back on that, too, is is, you know, coming from someone that I, you know, I toured some and it's more for your for your girl for her to be around your family, yeah. because if you guys are living in California and you go on tour, she's there by right. herself. She, she's so, I mean, there you, by get, herself, right? you know, it's definitely more of a move for her than it is maybe yeah. for you. That's a good you point. Just bottom line. Yeah. That's, exactly that's a, the that's point. a fucking great point. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, fucking good on you, dude. That's awesome. Congrats. Yeah, to especially you like, cause my wife is like really tight with her sister. They like have a really tight bond. And, you know, dude, I was like, I miss the birth of my daughter. And so if she wasn't like Josh is saying with the family unit, uh, you know, and foundation right. around her, it would have been unacceptable. You know? Right. No, for sure, dude. No, that's a good, really good point. <laughs> well, so, well uh, you know, looking back on on or getting ready for the interview, kind of looking back over your career. And the one thing that I've noticed with you, you, you are a true you know, new metal soldier, you know, you've been, you've, you've consistently been putting out albums. You didn't go away for a long time. Right. This is, you know, you're not coming back up now for a reunion. I mean, you've been like, you know, going, Constant. you never stopped. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like kind of talk yeah. about that part of the, of the career. Yeah, you know, and I wish I had some like a uh, really lofty reason for doing it, but it's just, <laughs> you know, it just comes out of like, uh, loving to make metal from uh, make money from metal and jamming. 
Right. You know what I mean? Uh, you know what? If somebody offered me a job where I could stay home and make as much money as I do touring and stuff, I'm sure I would tour less and whatever. But, you know, selfishly, it's it's a niche that I found a way to to make money, you know, and <laughs> God, I fucking love rocking. That's for damn sure. Right. You know, so that's just that easy and simple minded, you know. I mean, you know, knowing what you know now, especially with, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I just think about back in the day with just how much money was being thrown around, you know, yeah. like uh, knowing what you know now, like what would you have done differently in that regard? Oh, you know? wow. What a great question. Cause you know, I'm not one of these people who's like, I have no regrets. Oh dude, I have so <laughs> many. Regrets. Yeah, I have all the regrets. <laughs> 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 all of them right of them. here. Yeah. I mean, dude, you know what? I would definitely um, invest my money differently from the money because dude, I was, I was getting big chunks of money. It's, you know, we signed what they, they call that million dollar record deal, which you guys know, part of it goes to uh tour support and right. equipment and uh, recording, but you do get some fucking cash, you know, uh, but you know, my parents were never that great with money. Uh, you know, I don't want to put it off on them, but at the time I was living a polluted lifestyle, you know? Um, so I, I was definitely longevity and the future was the last thing from my mind. Just having a dude, I was really that heavy metal cliche at the time when we got signed, you know, just, <laughs> just fast money, fast women, nope. just whatever I could get my hands into. So, you know what, if I could go back, I would do that differently. And I would, I would approach my career differently, um, from the, in terms of the money that's coming in and what I'm going to fucking do with it. Not only that, um, I dare say it, if I could go back, I would, I, I would, um, pay more attention to the way I was doing my songwriting, hmm. you know, um, to try and get a little, get a little more success out of that new metal songwriting. So mm -hmm. you do, if you want to start, like I said, I got all the regrets right. we can, we can go on and on about that, but definitely, you know, finances, I would have treated differently. Um, you know, dude, even petty little shit. Like we played a radio show for a big, the big radio, uh, station in Boston and they told me not to curse and I fucking cursed and, from that moment on, they never played and, us again. Fan for life. would never play us. You know, like talk about holding a grudge, right? Right. So, like, if I could go back, I'd never fucking curse. You know. <laughs> right. So, you know, but it was one of those deals. Like again, this is the cliche of just uh, you know, drugs, sex, and rock and roll just was ro ruling my life at the time. I mean, all things considered, you think about it, it's like you're very much a product of the environment at the time, too. I mean, I wasn't living in L.A. Uh, back then, you know, but I mean, the, the between the club scene and then seeing your friends bands getting signed and getting these deals, like, I mean, in a weird way, it's almost like, how do you not do all the dumb shit? <laughs> you know what? I, I totally agree. Definitely. That's what was the environment. Like you're saying, it's like, you know, you're when you're a fish and you don't realize you're even getting wet, you know, and right. just in water, everybody else is swimming around you. And definitely at the time in Huntington Beach in L.A. Wow. It was just it was pretty nuts. Um, right the drugs and the sex and everything that was going on. And I'm sure it must still be going on. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. Well, it is still LA. That part will never stop. So kind of looking back at it too, um, signing with Jive, you know, hindsight being 2020, would you guys have still signed with Jive? No because, way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no I mean, obviously way. being label mates with like Britney had to be kind of wild. No, that was a mistake. Um, the manager at the time, uh, rest in peace, was just, I'm sure he went for whoever offered the most money that would Correct. get him the biggest commission. Just that simple, you know, um, we should have, dude, we had Warner Brothers and like the other labels that knew what to do with uh, metal bands and whatever. We were the first rock band on Jive, right? <laughs> Before that, it was all like two short Britney Spears and in sync, right? We were the first band signed. That's why like million dollar record deal. But, you know, who cares if they don't know what the what they're doing with you? You know, right. at the time. Um, having said that though, they did some things right. Cause I'm still able to like, 
well, at least before COVID, I was able to like go, you know, to Europe and mm -hmm. um, overseas because of the work that Jive Sister Company, uh, Music for Nations, which is a, oh, yeah. a more of a global label, did for Head PE, mm -hmm. right? So they did a good job getting the name out and getting us quite popular. Well, you know, good enough overseas to bring in some income. Right. But definitely, like, what a great question, Josh. If we went back, I would sign with Warner Brothers. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, just kind of jumping on that question also, um, you know, did did the fact that they were hip hop and, and kind of R&B related, did that did they have any kind of influence beyond the money aspect of it? Like, did you guys make any kind of headways through any of the rap or R and B from their side? Or were they just like, Oh, we don't know what to do. You know, <laughs> you know what, you know, for sure they put some money behind bartender, which got that like, you know, top, top 30 or I don't know, top 20 or something. Okay, so they played that radio game a little bit. So they, you know, they kind of knew that was going on. But no, as far as what you're asking in terms of did it help us with hip hop acts, you know, yeah. helping us? Not at all. I was going to say, like, because I don't recall ever seeing like, you know, like anybody like too short or anything being like, dude, this head PE band, holy fuck, you know, <laughs> was like, you know, nobody was, that's why I was, I was dude. like, that would be the reason to sort of do it in a weird way would be to like, oh, okay, cool. Like maybe we can introduce Britney Spears audience to this harder thing, <laughs> but it's like, dude, that's what no, I'm none of that happened, but I'll <laughs> tell you what, the way they kind of like courted us or wooed us with like, you know, the first class trips to New York City and sitting in the conference rooms with the Britney Spears and the NSYNC and the two short platinums on the wall, like, right. dude, uh, I'm just, <laughs> like, if I could go back, I would know this doesn't mean anything, bro. You right. know what? My mindset at the time was like, wow, I'm getting signed. Like, it, uh, dude, I swear in my mind that that was it. I would have a career now forever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the furthest thing from the truth. What really tripped me out about the business is when I, we left Jive, how like, so many people, and this was even true about uh, other bands and stuff, people who seemed like they were your friends and tight and down, man, it just became like a ghost town. Like, right. whoa, where'd, every, where'd everybody go? <laughs> That is that is a hundred percent the way it works in this in the music industry. One last thing on Jive: was there ever like a, a Jive Christmas party or any any uh, anything where Head PE was invited and the guys from NSYNC were there and Britney hanging oh, around? Any great. any kind of any kind question. of that? What a great question! Let me think <laughs> about that. And the other part of it too it, is you know. Doesn't doesn't pop into my mind <laughs> you know at first i was thinking of a, a club i was at where snoop was there and too short but i think it was related to a jive party but it was like some other guy i knew was like the promoter anyway so i really don't think there was any star studded evenings i believe one time the ceo like uh invited me and i went to madison square garden and and saw um saw a heavyweight boxing fight. I think that, that was the closest <laughs> I came to. I never got to rub elbows though, with right. anybody. Right. <laughs> the, the other part of it too, is, you know, if they gave you the million dollar record deal, like how in, in, in the big scheme of things, how that's kind of chump change for, compared to Britney and NSYNC and all those guys. I mean, you guys were like, right. a, almost like a write off at that point. Oh dude, you are so right. But at the time, it just felt like, OK, I get to finally quit my job and my right. job is music. And, you know, it was more of a mental thing yeah. than a than a nuts and bolts thing, you know, yeah. um, just like kind of swept up in the romance of getting a record deal, which, right. by the way, in fucking 1996, no Internet. Like there's mm -hmm. no other way to get your music out besides right. getting a record deal, you know, um, so definitely it's definitely you know like was more romanticized getting signed than like today uh, not getting signed is romanticized <laughs> mostly right. like amongst like hip-hop uh right. artists you know they're constantly rapping about it being independent and not getting signed and all that but that mentality didn't even exist in the no. 90s right and i, I will say I don't know if it was if it was Jive or if it was something with you guys or whatever, but I will say that whoever had the financial backing of you guys back then 
promotional wise, you couldn't get away from a head PE sticker. Like you would turn a corner and there would be 13 head PE stickers in your pocket somehow, you know? (laughs) I mean, that was definitely there. Dude. Yeah. That's like why I said, you know, I could talk a lot of shit. They dropped the ball on some shit, you know, dude, because bro, at the time, uh, Chester Bennington, uh, uh, singer for Lincoln park was like, I want you guys on my label and I, you guys should be way bigger, you know, yeah. and Jonathan Davis, you know, singer of corn called me on the phone. Like you guys should be fucking big as Limp Bizkit. We, I want you on my label. So dude, I've got like these really famous, powerful rock stars, like calling me and telling me they want to help me and uh, getting in contact with the, my label and my label telling them to fuck off, <laughs> you know, yeah. rather than going, oh, okay, Jared, or, or right. go ahead then. Yeah. With, or like, yeah, we, we, you know, it's good for you guys to move on. Right. You know, like, right. It becomes a because pride like, thing. Of like, there was a mentality it. at the label that was like, we understand that, you know what, you guys probably should be a little bigger than you are. But like my dude, Josh just said, they did have that street team thing going, you know, where the stickers and the, mm-hmm. the free this or that they had kids yeah. out there promoting it but you know a lot of things need to kind of line up for your to get this most juice out of the squeeze right yeah no for sure for sure it's been, well you know <laughs> actually to, to sort of switch gears but keep it on a similar kind of thing like yeah. when i think back like to like those those jägermeister days you know that, <laughs> you know like when i think of like that sort of stuff man where it was just everywhere i mean when when you were on tour especially back then, like, you know, booze and drugs, everything was just everywhere. Uh, like I always wonder, like, cause I've, I've been on tour, but like, I was, I didn't drink alcohol at that time and I just smoked weed and all these kinds of things. So I was never like, you know, I never had like the blackout moment or I'm going to drink or, drink. <laughs> you know, like it was never, that was never my thing by any stretch. But, like, <laughs> but back in the day, I'm like, did partying ever help? <laughs> <laughs> or did it ever like did you guys just wake up like and just be like fuck dude i can't do this again like it's oklahoma city can we not have a night where <laughs> we're not yeah. doing shots yeah. off of some stripper you know dude it's just like i keep using the word cliche but that's really what my life is and you know what is it about like guys and bands who are just first of all you're in a place where everyone who's coming to see you is partying right, right? It's always their so, Friday night, you know? Yeah. yeah. Every night is their party. So for me, I got swept up in that. And obviously it's, I'm not the first one. Like there's something about musicians and drinking and drugs. That's like peanut butter and jelly. Right. right. So I was again, uh, rather than swimming upstream, I was going with the current <laughs> of just what seemed to be the right thing. But of course you're out there going, Oh man, I can't believe I've been up for three and a half, four right. days, <laughs> you know, and you it, starts show tonight. Get, it starts yeah. to get super gnarly. Plus, you know, the Jack Daniels. And that's when you start fighting with your band members, you know, um, I'm having just, flashbacks over here. So <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Jack Daniels bring the worst out of anybody, but, yeah, um, for you sure. know, like, dude, I remember a time when I would count down to an hour before the show and then just start getting wasted, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, like that'd be when I uh, set the timer to have my first Jack and Coke be an hour before the show and just keep drinking until the show started. You know, again, like if I could go back, I wouldn't fucking do that. These days, I'm like doing warm ups in the fucking in <laughs> right. The rig. You know, you I want to get out there. I'm, I'm, <laughs> fully con- I'm concentrating on having the best vocals that I can. <laughs> you know, and right. I would be this way back then if I had a time machine. You know. Yeah, ironic that your your tour is called detox. <laughs> right. that's, a life, that's a lifelong process, apparently. That's fucking fun. Um, ebbs, ebbs and flows. Ebbs and flows. So there on the uh, on on Primer fifty five debut record, there are two main guests on it. Was uh, DJ Kilmore from Incubus? I've had him on the show talking his uh, his uh, you know scratching <clears throat> on the record, and obviously you know you you popped up on set it off. Um, mm. kind of talk about recording those vocals and, uh, uh, you know, that, how did the collaboration come about and then, you know, and then getting the track and all that good stuff. Well, yeah, dude, again, that is like a sign of the times. I don't remember what year that was, but like, 
I do a lot of features now, right? And people yeah. just send me their music and I have my own little studio and I record shit and send it back. That at the time I did the vocals for set it off, it was still old school, you know. There was yeah. no internet. So I only heard the song, I believe, when I pulled up to their studio. I actually went to the primer studio and like you know collabed with them while writing to the track which is something i never do anymore and now i'm so like <laughs> secluded and like i get a track and i write it myself and just send it back but that was fun and think and i i have a perfect picture in my mind of the studio and everything um but yeah it just sticks out in my mind as a sign of the times you know and how shit used to be before the internet when it came yeah. to music you know, like now, you, hey, I can have someone just send me their ideas. My whole last record I co-wrote with a guitar player from the Netherlands, you know, <laughs> and nice. we've been writing for like five years together. Like back in the day, you'd have to come drive over and, and put your fucking cassette in and right. <laughs> play it for me. Right. But anyway, yeah. Primer 55 hooked me up. They paid me good and they got me there and. And it was a great time, you know. Um, I always love seeing seeing any of those guys anytime I can on the road or whatever. Sometimes they'll pop up at a show. Yeah, it's uh, it was it was always fun, uh, you know, the random people that would want to do your part of set it off live, <laughs> and, and I would be like, I would see like these random dudes walking on stage. I'm like, hopefully they can pull it off. Some people did, some people didn't, <laughs> but always always a good time. It kept you on the edge of your seat, right? right. Yeah, I'm like, what, what is this guy going to do? Where do, they, where do they find this one? <laughs> well, actually, you know, we have a song called American Beauty, and then um, my girl rapped like the second verse, and then it became pretty popular in the underground where at every show we'd have some random girl who would want to rap it. And just <laughs> like you saying, it was a crapshoot. Sometimes <laughs> right. Bless, her, bless their hearts. Sometimes you'd get like a, a guest vocalist who had no rhythm at all. <laughs> right. And sometimes you're pleasantly surprised, right, at how good they're doing. Yeah. Totally. Actually, speaking of being on a on somebody else's record, uh, I wanted you to tell me about your straight up uh the, the song you did for straight up, like about kind of the day you conceived the lyrics, kind of what the feeling was like in the in the vocal booth. Uh, because I mean that was at a pretty crazy time for you i think right yeah you know what um that is a similar a memory to the one i was just referencing with primer because again it was previous to uh the internet and i was at the studio with mikey dolan and um uh and i was there with my dj dj product and so it, we were writing and doing all the recording right there. So it was like a, you know, a collaborative event where he'd say, try this and I try this or try that. But, um, wow. You know, uh, seeing too many good people, uh, you know, die way too early. Lynn straight being one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I do remember at that time in my own personal life, I was kind of hating it. I remember going down to LA for the, um, for the shoot, uh, for the album cover. Um, and I just remember being really salty and sour about my own, uh, professional life at the time. I believe it was before I met my girl and uh, definitely I was still living in SoCal, but yeah, so that was it. You know, I have this weird way of dealing with uh, the death of people I know and, and have uh, hold it, in, it dearly, you know, I kind of, I don't enjoy funerals and I would, ra you know, rather not see them in that state. The same went for Lynn Stray, you know, it was pretty intense definitely counted him as a friend we spent many nights on tour partying he used to let me have a bunk in the snot tour bus <laughs> at a time when head pe was still traveling in a tiny little rv so him and i got into many deep conversations and anyway you know he'll be missed but um it was a good experience though uh recording that song for the tribute record right on I've had uh, I've had Morgan on talking about her uh, her her um, 
contribution to broke from Kitty. Uh, you know, when, wow. Um, and you know, she obviously was uh, was super hyped about that. I mean, I guess we're just in a collaboration zone. So I mean, so talk about getting <laughs> Sur- Surgeon or Surgeon Morgan on one of your tracks. Okay, yeah. So that was a different where I that was kind of uh, an internet type thing in the way that. I was never in the same room with them. Oh, nice. Um, hmm. uh, I had like written the parts and sent it to them and said, can, <laughs> you, can you do these parts? And then they send the parts back. And then my producer machine, who then mm-hmm. went on to like produce all the lamb of God records and yeah. now sits on a mountain of cash. Um, <laughs> He fucking put those together, and there you have it. The rest is history. And one of my favorite tracks, really. You know, um, sure. I, I brought it up earlier, but I just kind of want to touch back on it. You know, where where there's kind of like this new metal resurgence. Obviously, we're doing a new metal podcast in 2023. You know, for 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 uh, for Not Fest, and you know, uh, the sick new world lineups, things like that. All these just festivals kind of coming back out. But I mean how is it for you to kind of see a lot of these guys like bands getting back together to do this stuff? Are you, are, are you happy that they're getting back together? Are you like, where have you guys been for the last 20 years? I've been, I've been slugging it out in the streets. Like, like how, how are you feeling about all this? That's interesting. Um, you know, it, I'll tell you it's COVID that gave me a chance to kind of step back and take a breath and kind of um, appreciate the last 20 years of, of my career, because like you guys were saying earlier, it's like, I've been the guy who's kind of hasn't taken any breaks. So it's just kind of been record hustle tour, record tour, record tour. Always. Finally, when COVID hit and I couldn't do what I was used to doing and I'm still recovering from all that. um, But it really made me go, Oh wow. And kind of like, you know, I hate to use the word proud, but just kind of like I even like came back with a new metal madness tour, Mm -hmm. which for a while, new metal was kind of like a bad word. And even the the guitar player from um, Avenged Sevenfold, who who said he's a head P.E. fan, um, had said that when he was coming up, new metal was a bad word. Mm-hmm. And to be called new metal was a derogatory thing, you know. Right. But, um, it, dude, but when we're at, like when Primer or Head PE, when we were back there doing it back then, nope, there was no label for it. Right. It was just like, hey, let's combine what was kind of grungy metal with like hip hop elements, kind of. Right. And then after the fact, they started calling it new metal. Anyway, yeah. but. Um, you know what? I don't hold it against anyone for coming back or leaving. Everyone has their own, you know, uh, path to travel. And, um, and I, I just love anything that can boost my brand or, or help me have a better rock show. You <laughs> know, that's again, it's not any lofty, righteous minded things that I'm doing. It's just loving to fucking rock out and Hey, can I make some money from it? And as well. So, I'm stoked on the uh, dude because we did the new metal madness tour and it was well attended, you know. Yeah, people love it, dude. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> you know, well, the, like, the new metal madness tour was that not the uh, the infamous uh, Crazy Town tour? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Oh Jesus! Wow, <laughs> Crazy Town. You know, Seth did apologize to me. Bless his heart. Yeah. Wish him the fucking best. What a scene that was, though. Yeah. Oh, my God, right? Yeah. He, he would be like, okay, so then he would fly like a hype guy out. Then all of a sudden, you know, he's doing whatever he's doing. And then <laughs> he's not making the show. And so there's, like, no members from Crazy Town there. <laughs> just his hype guy, who's yeah. a guy named Bobby, who used to sing for Edema. Anyway, yeah. I digress. So he doesn't show up at the show and then would like show up the next day. Like, 
you know, I want to get paid for that show. I'd even show up at anyway. I've said too much. I'm sure he wouldn't even give a fuck if I told you, cause you know, he's trying to get sober right now. And these are the types of things that I describe that are unacceptable anyway to anybody who's on tour and normally only happens because of some, uh, drug chemical, you know, um, situation anyway you guys but yeah no i mean in, in all in all honesty i mean being being in primer with jason before he passed away you know i yeah. mean he was going through his struggles and you know where you're trying to get on stage you put on a good show but at the same time your singer's kind of staring at his shoes singing loose you know and you're like you're like uh oh, this just sometimes the sometimes the demons catch up to you man all right Dude, yeah, you know what? I'm used to like musicians who uh, can kind of like control their addictions and maybe only, you know, at least either save it till after the show or know your limitations so that you're not on stage just fucking up. But dude, I've been on stage with guitar players who are so inebriated <laughs> they're right. just in another zone, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so. uh, that's the. I mean, it, actually, that leads into something I was going to ask was that you, know, you guys have had so many members over the last I don't uh, know, 20 <laughs> plus years, but 15, 16 members. I was like, uh, I mean, kind of what's the hardest part about going from the people that you play with on a certain record to like uh, the next incarnation is now different. And then the next incarnation, you know, like you're the main focal point, but everybody else is still switching. You know, like what's well, the hardest part about that transition? Huh? I'm going to tell you. The hardest part of that is um, because uh, I'm like not I'm I'm not a solo writer because I'm into metal. I always reply on uh, a guitar player who that I can write with. That's the hardest part is losing a songwriter. Right. Um, you know, uh, I was really blessed because. After I bailed from uh, West Style, who was my original collaborative partner, metal guitar player, who kind of set the standard and the tone for the band, right? Every successive guitar player would would feed off of the original West Style and, Chiz and Chad, the way they approach guitar, every other guitar player after that had to tap into that energy right okay right. um so it's up to me as the guy who's still there to make sure that's happening you know mm -hmm. uh that we're still playing head pe music even though the original writers are not there okay so right after wes i hooked up with this kid jackson who was just like amazing and was very head pe vibey you know so him and i did like five records together and then um, after that, then it became hard after he 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 was like, oh, I don't want to quit the band, but I'm tired of touring. And it's like, oh, OK, but like that's what this band does. <laughs> right. Anyway, part of the gig. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> then to kind of move on from him. It took me a while to find like this new writing partner, Remy, who's Dutch and lives in uh, the Netherlands. <laughs> but um yeah, so bro, that's the hardest part is finding new writing partners. It's become like a, a rapper thing where you know rappers are like searching through beats to find the beat they want to lace up, right. you know. Um, and a lot of being a good rapper is knowing what beat to get on, you know what I mean? Like, if whether you're Drake or Playboy or, or anybody, it's like you've got a million beats being thrown at you. And you've got to select the ones that are going to fit your vibe. So, you know what? Head PE has become a lot of that with me choosing through a lot of tracks and making sure that they're hitting that that soft, that sweet spot, that head PE sweet spot. Because I'm well familiar with the uh, guitar pro approach, uh, the original vibe of the head PE guitar approach and all of it. So even though I've had all these members, the vibe will remain consistent. Right on. Touching on something you said a second ago about kind of being able to, to to stop for a second and look back and just marvel at the career, you know, marvel at that uh, shows you've played at the albums you've put out at the people you've played with all that stuff. I, I posted the other day that after editing an episode, 
a, a folder popped up of all these old interviews that I've done. And I was kind of clicking through them, watching the videos. And I almost teared up because, you know, you're, I'm sure yeah. you're the same way where you're always thinking about the next show, the next song, the next record, the right. next, the next, but you don't think about the past. And so I'm all, I'm always, all right, the Jared interview, we've got this, we've got this next, we've got, we've got to get these, you know, up on Instagram. We've got to do all this next stuff, but you don't take the time to look back and, and really, Go, holy shit, man! Look what I've done, and it's and it's it's a powerful thing when you can take a breath and just see what you've done. Right, and you know what? Part of it is from where I'm at is uh, a lot of times, and I'm sh I don't know if you guys go through this, but I'm always going to tie my level of success to my financial security, <laughs> and so at my level where I'm at, where I'm a club band and you know, it's a constant hustle. Like I said, before COVID, it's just a constant hustle to pay fucking bills from heavy metal, you know? Um, and so it's hard <laughs> to kind of stop and smell the roses, you know? But if, if I'm taking out the financial hustle of it, wow, what a fun, what an, ex what an exciting journey I've been on, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I've got to fucking you know, collaborate with some of my idols and legends and share stages with some idols and legends. And, you know, having people sing back your lyrics to you is a feeling that is like, what? It's, it's, it's <laughs> exhilarating. It's a hard word. It's, it's hard for me to find a word to describe that feeling, right? Even a small club that holds 300 people, that are like know all your shit and are digging it. There's a certain feeling there that only like good sex can rival, <laughs> you know? Um, right. So uh, yeah, dude, smelling the roses. That's what COVID helped me do yeah. is kind of sit back and be like, Oh wow. You know, this has been a sweet journey regardless. And another thing with COVID too, I think, was that the time when were you doing a lot of Twitch and a lot of like just uh, streaming and doing like live stuff? Uh, actually, your setup now, you probably have the best setup probably ever had on the podcast, but, uh, <laughs> your mic and your and your and your visuals there. But I'm, I'm just saying how much fun was that for you to kind of just jump on and do, you know, live streams and things like that? Dude, that's very fun because I'm always like to challenge myself with um, learning new technology and keeping my brain sharp, you know, so. You know, I work on a Mac and then the streaming stuff is on a PC. But anyway, doing all that is fun and kind of reaching out and just streaming and seeing people's comments and questions. is mm -hmm. That's fucking pretty cool to just reach out like that. Uh, I've been enjoying that. But I, you know what I found out is it's a lot harder than it looks. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's the worst. <laughs> and, on and, talk and whatever is like it's it's difficult. Yeah, when I joined NotFest, that's what I was doing first. It was their NotFest Twitch stream. And mm -hmm. it is the weirdest thing to sit here by yourself, but then there's like all a scroll of stuff going by. And then you've got like, you know, maybe a music video you want to play. And then you got to comment on the music video. It, it, it is definitely a, a wild place to be trying to uh, navigate everything going on all at once. Right. It's a different energy um, because like when I'm like doing music, it's like, I'll fucking sit and re-record the same line 50 times. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It right. And what you hear, you, it sounds like I just did it, mm -hmm. even though I spent two days getting a few lines down, you know, whereas when you're streaming, you don't have that luxury. It's just, hey, hey, hi, you know. <laughs> right. Oh, hey. Pause. <laughs> right, yeah. You can't pause it. Just like right, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> What do you got, Josh? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I, I'll get it. I, I mean, speaking of that, since you're talking about recording, I mean, obviously, Detox out December 15th. Uh, you can pre order now through, uh, I didn't write down the record label, but it's uh, Suburban Noise, right? No. Yes, sir. And oh, really? um, we've got the record Detox coming out the 15th. We've got um, the new uh, video for Waiting being premiered. Um, on uh, not fest uh 
this Tuesday, which is the 21st. Okay. I'm really excited about that. This new song, Waiting, is interesting because uh, it was inspired by my son, who's 16, all of his kind of like romantic social issues when he was a freshman. <laughs> you <laughs> <Okay>. know? <laughs> so I was like writing from his perspective, which is That's was funny. interesting because, you know, I've been with my... I'm blessed enough to where me and my girl, we're tight. We've been together for a while. And so writing about like, you know, crazy <laughs> relationship stuff doesn't come naturally, at least not from my own perspective. So it was nice to write about relationship stuff from the eyes of a, of a youth, you know, <laughs> well, yeah, it's, uh, I, will, I'll, I will dive in on this one real quick. Oh, Have, having a 16 year old son, my son is 18 and it's it's funny the world that we live in now that I thought being a parent during was going to be so much different to where I'm having to worry more about like Snapchat and vaping and things like that. Like it's 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 an epidemic, but it's it's crazy how like of the things that I didn't think I was going to have to deal with as a parent and where, where it is like, you know, cause, cause he got in trouble for posting something stupid on Snapchat. He got in trouble for vaping at school. It's like, it's like every time I turn around, I'm like, what world am I living in? <laughs> oh yeah. It's unrecognizable from when I was his age. Oh right. my God. I don't know if I'd fucking make it. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? Where everything you do is immortalized. <laughs> right. Forever. <laughs> By way of your phone, you know, right. you're not getting away with shit. Oh, man. Well, that actually I, goes into one of my questions, which is like when you're performing songs from like broke, you know, do you ever feel weird? Like looking out to the crowd and being like, shit, <laughs> like now that, you know, just being a dad and everything. You oh, know? yeah, dude. You know <laughs> what? Sometimes I can get swept up in a certain energy and it's totally different. But like what you're saying to where it's kind of like, ironic and i'm right it. <laughs> it's like and you got I'm somebody's smiling. eight-year-old kid walking around singing like bartender and you're like that's not really <laughs> yeah. well right because then i'll meet like you know older people who who are like yeah i was listening to your record i was 13 and my mom would get so mad and i was like right. oh yeah she had every right to be mad yeah, right. i'm actually <laughs> mad at you i'm, yeah, right. Where's yeah, she? I'm gonna talk to her what's wrong with you being a bad parent <laughs> Start but yeah guys it is weird it is yeah. fucking weird and there's even songs that i don't want to play because they make me feel so cringy but people want to hear them yeah you know? <laughs> uh, yeah i mean especially i mean god I, especially a lot of the stuff that's on broke i mean like you know it's just funny like when we will you know do karaoke and we'll sing it around here it's funny it's fucking hilarious and then you go to a show like sick new world or something and you're like you're like, yeah, you know, like you see, like there's like eight year olds with their parents and everything, and I'm like, are they listening to Corn's first record? Like, is that what's going on right now? <laughs> you know, like, dude. But then think about it. It's even, it's even worse though now because then like all of our kids have like iPhones or phones right. and they're listening to iTunes or Spotify, and of course all the hip hop. Some of it is very explicit yeah. Yeah. over <laughs> over corn or head pe well i don't know head pe has some shock value lyrics that right. <laughs> much take all the way over the edge but it's not meant for kids you know <laughs> right. like you're saying you see a kid there and you're like whoa i'll just have to blame the parents right. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. That that is the toughest thing in the world is when you hear your kids listening to music with questionable lyrics and do you want to be the dad that goes in and like stops them from listening to it? Or do you put yourself back into that situation? Like right. I was kind of listening to doggy style listening. and you right. know, that, that's kind of got some rough lyrics on it too. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm so glad you brought up doggy style because I was at a Snoop Dogg concert. Mm -hmm. And just like you're saying, like he's much older now and <laughs> right. some of his lyrics are pretty fucking crazy and there's kids there, but uh, you he know what? The world we today. live in where if violence is just there's war and there's violence on the fucking TV every five minutes. It's like I guess like dirty rap lyrics are the least of our worries, maybe. Yeah, I don't you know. That's true too, I think. I, I had to have the talk a couple of times because I would drive him to school and I would let him play music on the way. And 
And to you know, growing up listening to metal, obviously it's dragons and demons and and swords yeah, yeah. and fire. You know, so it's it's yeah. fantasy. And I'm like, and we would be driving, and it would be whatever lyrics or whatever on. And I'm like, I'm like, just so you know, like this isn't real life, <laughs> right? This exactly. is, you know, this might be fun to sing about and fun to play with, but I mean, this is not how to treat a woman or how you know women want to be treated. You know, all that stuff. I'm like, you know, this is this is a, a fantasy world. I'm like, don't take any of this seriously. Right. Well, right. right. And especially when we're talking about like real fucking grimy, like gangster rap these days, which is actually done from like, you know, is is poverty stricken people from the hood who are actually <laughs> killing each other and then pick up a mic and rap about it. Like <laughs> this is unprecedented, really, kind of what we're hearing. I feel like these days compared to the 90s when it was kind of like the rappers weren't necessarily doing the crimes. Now you've got like pe the kids who are actually murderers becoming rappers. Right. Which is amazing. No, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it is what it is, yeah. you know, the murdering but, and the poverty and all, and the social situations came first. Right. You know, but in the end it is still the parental influence. I mean, you know, back in the, in the late eighties and the you know, 90s, time. Yeah, back oh, in the late yeah. 80s and 90s, you know, I was listening to all sorts of crap. And my parents were like, they were so tuned out of it. So it's like, you know, for, you, for you, Josh, or you, Jared, you know, it's like for us to actually know what we were listening to back then and be like, let's have the conversation. I think that's kind of where where, where it at least changes a little bit, you know. But right. you know, I, was, I was thinking about like Waiting to Die and stuff like that when you're like singing that live. I, I think the last time we saw you, I think you might you guys did that or bartender. And I was just looking at my wife and I'm like, this kid's here. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, okay. And I was like, yeah, no, I guess so. And then you kind of start thinking about it. But yeah, it just uh, brought up the question. Well, right. And, but that's up there with like people who are making movies that are rated R and then yeah. kids are seeing them. And it's like, we can't yeah. blame the, the filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No, for sure. <laughs> too true. Too, too true. Rose also at the movie like, theater going, like, there are kids the kid, here. The kid yeah, right? wants to watch Family Guy. Right. No, and for sure. It's not meant for him, but it's a cartoon. Right. Right. So, so it's attractive it. to your right. ten year old. <laughs> That's kind of it. The That's only it. time my dad ever came into my room and told me to shut something off was I was listening to a Henry Rollins like spoken word thing and he kept okay. saying the word shit. And, and I don't, and I don't know why, but he was like, finally, like that was his breaking point. I was like, all the, all the Pantera and Slayer I could handle, but Henry Rollins spoken word was what I had right. to shut off. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta set this down now. <laughs> Maybe pops just wasn't feeling it that day. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, Let's, let's dive into detox a little bit more though, man. I mean, you're talking about writing overseas over the internet and all that, all right. that good stuff. Um, yeah. you know, just, just talk to me about, you know, the writing process for detox. Okay. Well, the writing process for detox is like my guy, Remy, who's like amazing guitar player, kid, a uh, Dutch kid. He'll like send me a Dropbox with fucking 20 songs in them. Right. And I'll be like, oh, these 10 are the shit. And then I'll start recording vocals to them. Right. And then I'll send them to my drummer and he'll fucking MIDI out some like drum sessions to them. And I'll send it to around to the guys in my band and get it all back. And, and it, that's the creative process. But detox is is uh this record was recorded over a year ago uh and it was uh really inspired by a lot of what happened during the pandemic and a lot you know a lot of chemical um abuse issues uh but yeah i think it's fucking i dude I, i've done fucking 13 records and <laughs> i'm always gonna think that the last one is is a good effort but i think this one is really vibey though and uh there's there's been three singles and all my people out there are listening to it and seems they seem to be thinking the same thing so i'm proud of it i got ulrich wild to mix it so it yes. has kind of a nice metal sound so i'm stoked yeah that sounds huge i was listening to it today yeah, yeah. right on bro and ulrich is an amazing producer great dude dude he's magic man yeah he really is that guy's got a ear Dude, when I got back to tunes, I was like, what the fuck did you do? Like, light a he candle. Like he knows how to make it sound big. Goat or... <laughs> yeah, he makes it sound big. 
there's definitely some satanic rituals now. <laughs> Especially, especially when you see his, like his family and his home and everything, you're like, yeah, there's no, yeah, it's like you, you, yeah. how did you produce this? But he's he's just got a really good ear for that sort of thing. So I'm yeah, glad you guys hooked up with him. He's definitely a good dude. Yeah, yeah, definitely, bro. Uh, after this last thing, it's like, oh my god, I just every time I do a record, this guy has got to fucking mix and master it. Yeah, I don't blame you there. When you when you write lyrics, or do you have a like a running notebook, or notes app in your phone? Are you are you on the spot? You know, when you open up the track, like where are you at with lyrics? Okay, well, generally, I'm I'm listening to the track and like letting it kind of tell me vibe wise what the subject's gonna be, uh, like the subject that fits the vibe of the guitar riff. Generally, generally, that's how I. I 90% of my songs start with me listening to a song 50 times and going, here's what that song's trying to say, at least the what I'm feeling. You know, every once in a while, though, I'll have, I'll come up with a, a, some lines first and then fit them to music. Nine out of 10 times, though, the music tells me kind of where to go with it. Hmm. I'm also like, like super super self-loathing artist where <laughs> I have no problem with scrapping an entire uh, vocal approach to a song and starting over. Not, you oh. know, um, like waking up and listening to what I thought was great and hating it and having to start <laughs> over. You know, you're um, so excited to show it to your wife, and then you're like, you hit play, and you're like, oh god, never mind. Yeah, right. <laughs> go, go back to hanging out with your sister. I'll be back. Yeah, right. You just described it right there. You know, I was told once by somebody, as you tell a lot about your music by how you feel when you're listening to it in front of different people. Mm -hmm. it's right. So true, right? Like you're gonna feel one way in front of your wife when you play song A. When you play song A in front of your home, we lost him. Trying to get into that okay. mind space, you know, like if I play this for so and so, what would they think, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, if yeah, I'm just, I'm not a. Mm -hmm. After day, I'm still liking it, dude. There are so many tracks. There's tracks off of every record that when I hear, I'm like. Oh God! Like, what was I thinking? <laughs> right? You know, like, cringing. Like, oh my God! Like, that's the worst melody, the worst lyrics anyone has ever written, and I'm the one who did it. <laughs> I'm the guy. <laughs> yeah. do, you go in, do you go into songs with like more than one like vocal style, like, or do you, or do you just try and pump it out like in the in on the spot? Like, see I'm where kind of figuring it out, like. I'm kind of figuring it out of again, like I'm hearing a riff and repeating it over and over and just uh, thinking what's going to sound best to it. Maybe it's rap. Maybe it's melody. Maybe it's yelling and screaming. Maybe it's super soft. You know, I just got to let the music kind of guide me. All right. So your, your dude, Remy, is he coming to the States to do the touring or is he your writing oh. partner? He's just my writing guy. Okay. Um, again, like we met during the pandemic and that's what kind of forged our, um, our writing thing. And then during the pan, it's weird. It's interesting because as I'm talking about it, I'm figuring out why things are the way they are. <laughs> but um, <laughs> during the pandemic, the guitar player that I was writing with uh, who was in my band was all of a sudden in Australia with a girl he met on tour with us and he was caught over there and um, he was busy. And so him and I weren't writing together. Meanwhile, me and this Dutch kid are writing together. Meanwhile, this other kid isn't coming back to even be in the band. <laughs> so, so then I have to uh, hire another guy, you right. know, who's in the band now. Great fucking guitar player. His name's, Nathan Javier. And so I'm already writing with Remy and that just continues. Now Nate's in the band. I'm starting to write with him, but Remy and I already have kind of a working, you know, a way that we work and a little bit of chemistry. Nate and I are building that as well. Cause obviously we're playing on stage every night together, 
but that's kind of how it's just evolved, you know. I met Remy first and we just keep writing together, you know. So is he Remy keeps, technically a part of Head PE? Is is he a part of Head PE? Well, he is. Well, I mean, you know, when you say a part of Head PE, my answer is yes, definitely right. he is. You know, um he's fucking written like three records this Oh. Oh. I don't know, but we've written like 30 songs together for Head PE. <laughs> so yeah, so he is part of Head PE, but there's no way for him to move here and be in the band, right. you know? So it's just this weird situation, which serves me right now. It's fine. And what's so amazing, you guys, is like when we play the tracks, you know, live uh, when we're on the road, they're just so fucking huge. And they've never been played before, as opposed to like most bands or whatever, you're playing the tracks live first, then recording them. This one's kind of backwards. The tracks have never been played by the band until the record's done. Right. Then I'm like, hey, guys, learn waiting or learn this track, and then we'll go and play it, and the shit will just be so fucking nice and big and huge. So that's nice. That's, that's always interesting to play it for the first time. Hey, I, Josh, I don't know if you can see it on Jared's thing where it says detox. Yeah. I love the fact that your head is like where the O is. <laughs> it is. It, <laughs> does, it does look like that's the fucking best. Right I've been looking <laughs> at that for like the last like five minutes. Like, that's the fucking best thing ever. Bro, you're high as a kite right now. No. <laughs> you that? Don't you think? That should be fellas, the tour flyer. Don't you think on the record they should just cut out my face and yes. put it on the no, yeah. O? That would be pretty cool. And then we get Road to make those, uh, you know, those giant heads. Yeah, right. Like where where they could they could take on a stick. They could, no uh, way, all the you fans know, can you have. Need, you, need, you need a picture disc where it's just right there. Mm -hmm. And you can, we'll just spin it right on your face and it'll. That's it. Yeah. I could do all that shit. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I've just been looking at that and I'm just like, dude, that would be fucking hilarious. How is that not the cover of the record? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, an another band that kind of never that never stopped is Nonpoint, who you're going out with. I mean, which is kind of, yeah. you know, you guys and Nonpoint are, you know, kind of just barreled straight through those lean years of new metal, you right. know, of, of the of the rap, mm. uh, the pimp rock or rap, rap metal, whatever you want to call it, man. But it was uh, so, I mean, you guys going out on tour together for a few weeks at the end of the year, uh, you know, talk about getting that tour together. Well, yeah, but, I, you know, I. I don't feel like Nonpoint is new metal. I feel like they're just good metal. You that know? first record's um, pretty new. <laughs> it's pretty I just don't hear Elias rapping much. Like Do What you? a Day and uh, Oh and, yeah, Endure. Oh, no, and, right. Okay, yeah. no, you're right. You're right. Okay, I just always associate them with good fucking metal. No, they're good. Don't, don't get me wrong. No, no, <laughs> I'm not. I, I'm, okay, yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> when I think new metal. To me, it has to have, but you know what? That's not for me to say. To me, new because some people, I'm sure, because to me, bro, like corn, I guess uh, is corn new metal. Mm -hmm. Are they? Yeah, they're, they're like the, the fathers. Of it. Yeah, they're like the fathers of. But honestly, if you were to like really ask me what new metal sounds like, it's head PE. Like you know, you yeah. kind of get that. Like there's a lot of head PE in the in the. Uh, definition to me, but though you know, Ro and I have talked about this many a time where the definition mm. of new metal is everything from head PE to static X to, to Lincoln Park. Do so you right. know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's it's not necessarily a sound, right. it's, it's like an ethos, yeah. Like, That's okay, yes, yeah. yeah, I need to open my mind to that because, like, when y'all's tell me that Slipknot is new metal, in my mind, there's no <laughs> right, you're just like, right, in my it's mind, they're just. Great. I, I think what Josh said was right. It's like it's like an era and an ethos. Yeah. So it's it is no, that like right. ninety seven to two thousand four era, but it was this this sort of this sort of mindset also. You know. No, you are right. That's the way I need to look at it more. It is an era and an ethos of what went on. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, <laughs> because you know what? I'm thinking too narrow. I'm thinking like new metal is rap metal, which it right. isn't. And it just Much and it goes everywhere, right? But right. you know, on, on that topic, like what what band from that era did you think was? I mean, other than you guys, which you guys definitely should have. But like, what band from that era did you think should have been way massive that just never quite hit it? <laughs> what a good question! Oh wow, because there were so oh. many great bands back then, and then there were some that just like. 
took off into the stratosphere, some that kind of went like, you know, you guys drowning pool, that kind of thing. But then there were some that just like, they were so good, but never quite qu- across the threshold. So I was wondering yeah, which one so you might think of. My memory just sucks, <laughs> you know. Um, so I can't really think of any um, because I will say be, the cor- corn and the Deftones to me in the mid 90s were like the bands that I saw before they got signed that made me just go, whoa, that made me rethink music, you know. Right. But that happened to me as well when, you know, I heard like Red Hot Chili Peppers and maybe later Nirvana and Rage Against the Machine, you know. But going to see Korn and the Deftones was like, made me rethink my band and like what I was doing, you know. So, um, and to see them become like God bands and huge was was pretty rad. And I think uh, well-deserved. But dudes, I can't think of a band that like should have made it that. F- well, of course not, you yeah, know. Right. Um, but they, you know, rest. They were definitely well on their way. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, had Lynn stuck around, but you know, probably if someone brought up a name, I'd go, "Oh yeah, they were good." But right now, I'm having a. a, a <laughs> I was I was telling Josh, I I, I loved Human Waste Project. Oh shit! Yeah, dude. <laughs> oh yeah, you know that was a great Huntington band that I used to yeah. see all the time. There was another band um, that got signed briefly, and the singer passed away. They were called Deadlights. Oh yeah. And, okay. um, before uh, that, yeah. in Huntington, they were called Suction. Suction. But I always thought that uh, his name. What was Duke? What was my dude's name? Duke. Yep. Um, I thought he was really something else. Yeah. yeah. And they were great lives. I, I was on tour with them in Ozfest 2000 and they actually Josh was too. Um, but uh, yeah, I always loved seeing them live. They were so, so good, but yeah, they kind of yeah. just kind of went like this and then didn't quite, didn't quite catch on, which was unfortunate. Right. There, there was another band um, that my guitar player left to join their band and then they never really, they were called like uh, aggression, engi- not engines of aggression. Society's engine. Society. They were, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, but they were like signed. They were so good, and then uh, it never went anywhere. But that was like, dude, some bands get eaten up by the yeah. like, by when they get signed, like something happens. <laughs> yep. Well, when <laughs> I was at Roadrunner, we signed uh, we signed Rumblefish. Hmm. What's that? That rings a bell. Yeah. Yeah. Rumblefish. Uh, that was, they were big on the strip. Like, that was later on, like around like 01, like 0203. But, uh, but yeah, same thing. They got signed and then we just never put it out. It never came mm. out. But yeah, I was just kind of curious about stuff like that. Just because they were, because especially back in the day, you guys were touring with so many different kinds of bands, especially on Jaeger tours and whatnot. You know, oh, dude, so many. I'm sure that if someone brought them up, I would be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> well, I want to a- touch on something in there. You you talked about seeing Korn and Deftones before they were signed. What was the the air around those bands, like being in a in a small <laughs> club, seeing those guys pre, you know, pre-record? Whoa. Yeah. So, you know, this was before Head P.E. Uh, was formed. I was in a band called, like, Live Urban Sex Tribe, and then... Wes was in a band called like Liquid Tree. And then uh, then he talked and he goes, you've got to see this band, Korn. Um, uh, he was like, I feel like they're like uh, an example of where music is going. Wow. That's what he told me, you know. And um, the right. first time we went to see them, uh, it was sold out and we couldn't get in. And then the next time we went, then we got in. Oh, no, because we tried to go to this place in OC. The next time, the first time I saw Corn was at the Roxy. And it was like, there couldn't have been more than a, a couple hundred people there. Um, but fucking did exactly what I say. It made me rethink music. It made me quit my band and start the ba- start Head P.E. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> with seeing Corn. And then from there, I went and saw Corn again. With the Deftones and like uh, Sugar Ray, 
And then I like would, went and see 311 before they were huge. You know, these those were the bands that were like uh, very influential in the early head years of head PE. You know, uh, even though obviously you know you listen to head PE, it's nothing really like Corn or the <laughs> Deftones or the bands I've mentioned. Right. But there's just that energy, you know, that we're trying to tap into. Right. Well, it was the beginning of that ethos that that Josh spoke about. You know, it was the very beginning of that. Right. Yeah, I just uh, I just interviewed Peanut like a couple weeks ago, and I was like, you know, you guys were kind of a, a forefather of new metal. You know, like those guys. When I was listening to all that stuff in the early '90s, Three Eleven was one of those bands that kind of started incorporating the rap and the DJ and 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 kind right. of in the funk and you know and Peanut being an incredible bass player, kind of threw it all together. Oh, dude, I couldn't. That guy amazed me. Yeah, <laughs> dude, seeing Three Eleven, like everything you said is so true. Um, Three Eleven foreshadowed so much yeah. of what was to come, and mm -hmm. you know those guys became became a huge success and well deserved. Um, but you know, I dare say that um, Head PE um, getting signed was a direct response of of corn getting signed. And then dude, I'm sure you know that, especially in those days, pre-internet uh, record labels would descend on a, on a neighborhood that they sh thought had a vibe or had things right. popping off, mm -hmm. you know? So all of a sudden they've just signed fucking corn and the Deftones. I'm sure that the magnifying glasses came out. Next thing you know, we were signed. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. uh, Head PE wasn't together more than like three and a half years before we signed that deal. Um, oh, wow. So uh, I definitely think it was it was all related to the corn um, thing. Yeah, that, that first Sugar Ray record, too, I think the Lemonade and Brownies, I think, was, uh, you know, uh, could be, you know, in the ethos of the uh, early stages of new metal. Yeah, I think so. I would agree. Yeah. You know, and then, of course, Sublime, which is yeah. not new metal, but was so amazing to me as well. It's like I wish I could have tapped into more of their vibes in my own music, but I was definitely so into that too, what they were doing in the nineties. Well, that was yeah. the thing that orange County scene back then was so popping. It was so crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was doing a zine in New Jersey and we knew about the orange County, you know, it was like this mythical place. Dude, it was jumping off in the nineties like that. Like what's the name of that? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of the orange County band. That was, uh, pretty cool for a white guy. What was the name of that band? Offspring. The Offspring. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like that was more like punk, but mm -hmm. dude, it was kind of metal too, and a little bit rap. I don't know. That was kind of like blending, blurring the 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 right. lines. You know, well, all, all of those bands, no doubt. I mean, Sublime, right. like everybody kind of came in with this weird, like sort of hip hop y thing and a little right. bit of that OC punk. And I mean, it was just this weird thing that like suddenly just spawned out of Huntington. And everything seemed to happen in Huntington Beach at that point. You know, it was just Dude, like, yeah, it was it. jumping off. I, I moved, I, I was living in like Santa Ana or something and moved to Huntington in the early 90s. And just like you're saying, like all the pro skaters and, just yeah, uh, all the stripper there. culture and just <laughs> the fucking band culture. Those three things, skating, right. stripping, and band culture were just yeah. so potent in Orange County in the early 90s. For all I know, it still is, but I sure know it was back then, you know. Yeah, for sure. That's yeah. funny. We, we had, When we had Mikey Doling on talking, he did a, a track by track of Get Some, and that was what he talked about. He was like, he was, it was like, there was the snot house, the snot rehearsal uh, area, and the strip club. And, and, the strip and, club. It was, and it was like, and the strippers paid for everything and, you know, took care of them. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, like, right. and it was just so much of that, that culture of the time. All right. Right. And it is a rock cliche because mm -hmm. if you like look at like, uh, What's the, that movie, The Decline of Western Civilization? Yeah. Yeah. yeah part two. They're, they're interviewing a bunch of metal guys. Yep. They're like, oh, yeah, strippers buy our food. This yeah. that. Where it's just like, you know what? Broke musicians and and strippers always have gone together like peanut butter and jelly or something. <laughs> I think true, dude. more research is needed. Right. To <laughs> this is the psychology of that whole scenario. <laughs> Well, it's, it's like a vag. It's like a vagabond 
cult like a mentality or something you know like like they're on stage making money we're on stage making money like in you can kind of you know and probably not from the best backgrounds both right. sides you know what i'm saying like you know we just, we turned to metal because something may have happened to us and stripping you know there there's a history there too so i mean there's struggle there's, recognizes struggle is that struggle, what it is hustle hustle recognizes <laughs> hustle. i think josh has got it figured out i right? think so yeah, man we can it. it's right on point you guys yeah. just don't have to pick up dollar bills off the stage. That's pretty much it. Other than that, there's not really. I would, though. Yeah. Hey, if I'm playing bass and they throw a dollar, right, exactly. to me, I'm fine with that, too. It just happens that they don't. It's just a different way of getting paid. <laughs> That's all it is. I, get the, I get the dollars after this. It's after a living. Show. Yeah. <laughs> right. You were watching friggin' Flintstones and the microwave is just like, eh, it's a living, whatever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of shit. It is what it is. <laughs> it is, what it is. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean that, but yeah, I mean, I grew up in Nashville, and the whole mm-hmm. like we, I would, I would put a VHS tape in the, uh, you know, in the in the in the player and hit record when I went to bed, and when I woke up the next day, I would check and see what videos MTV had played overnight because that's when they were playing the No Doubt videos and the right. early Sugar Ray videos and shit like like they weren't playing them at mainstream, so I would I would check and see what the what the the new stuff was, and it was very much that Huntington Beach culture. Yeah. Right, was huge in the '90s, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember uh, when I went to that first Warp tour. That first Warp tour was like all of that sort of stuff. It was oh, yeah. so crazy back then, you know. And that's what <laughs> everybody wanted. That's like the birth of pop punk and all that. But, <laughs> right, but, dude. Yeah, but it's like, but that that area, that whole Orange County area, it's just spawned so many incredible bands. Yeah, yeah I swear, you know, it was between north norcal to fucking uh, san diego <laughs> yep that yeah, whole including san diego yeah, yeah. including san diego all those bands good. that were out there back then too oh yeah dude actually you know i was watching your interview with garza and you brought up chin strap oh wow you knew chin strap yeah, from way back in the day I remember when he passed away too, man. But yeah, so it's like that whole scene and, you know, it was all just one big scene. Like, you know, when I moved to, I moved to LA in in 98, in mid 98. So I was catching kind of the tail end of like system of a down playing the whiskey and shit, you know, but just to get caught up in the whole thing of that, it was like, it was so nuts back then, you know, every, I don't know, just like the, that kind of rebirth of street teaming, the whole, like you said, the whole ethos and era of it all was just so, it was like a hurricane out here. Like when I moved out here, it was like, I moved out here from New Jersey and New York. So, I mean, I was going to shows all the time, but yeah. man, it was like out, out here, there was like 90 shows a night, you know, <laughs> every band was awesome. It was like, oh, well, it's not in head PE are playing here. And then, you know, no doubt in this band's playing out and corn and Deftones are playing. Here. I'm like, all on the same fucking night? What the hell? But it was like all week long of just nothing but shows every night. You were either at the Key Club, you were at the Troubadour, you were at the Roxy, the Whiskey, House of Blues, you know, the Knitting Factory. You know, I mean, you were at one of any of these clubs at all, all, any time of day, any time of night, and there was a show going on. You know? What you're saying is so true. And like when I talk about it, like I'll say, you know, back then, like you're saying, there was something to do every night. All the like something time. was popping off somewhere <laughs> in some club or building every night of the week. Yeah. Just had to find out where it was. Yeah. And it was like, <laughs> at, when you found out after the fact, you're like, fucking static and head PE played the other night. What the fuck? How did I not know? You know, it was always, <laughs> there was always something going on. But I mean, that's, that was, that that's, that's where that scene was. And like you said, man, all the way from NorCal, the, like, or I would say, yeah, Bakersfield down to San Diego, man. Right. It was, and that was the best part for all those bands. They could just tour up and down and just do these great little tours where they'd be like, all right, what's snot and ultra spank and system doing great. We're going to, we're going to go all the way up to San Francisco and back for, you know, a weekend. And it was just, yeah, definitely the band culture was thick. Yeah. Compared, you know, look, it was, it was, it was super cohesive. Right. And if you wanted to make music, you were more inclined to get a band than to right. grab a laptop, which is if you're an artist in 2023, you might be more inclined inclined to just grab your laptop and go make music on, <laughs> you know, all by yourself. Yeah, I right. mean, that's really kind of the new punk rock is a guy in his fucking laptop, right. <laughs> right. or find a guy in like Norway or something, you know, like right. Right, right. right? Because in the 90s, like my dude is saying. 
the, the culture was so thick. So many people were in bands. So many bands were playing. Uh, man, I, I, it'll never, I can't imagine it will ever be that way again because of technology. So. Yeah. Because I don't think so, that was, because that's the thing. It's like when I came here, yeah, I already knew about Deftones and all these bands and everything like that. But just to, like, it was almost like you got thrown into like, the world's deepest ball crawl, you know, it's just like, you know, like got jumped in. And suddenly you just had shows <laughs> and bands and strippers and booze. It was just, it was so all encompassing, you know, that it was like, it, it was, it kind of felt like you were drowning at times, but in like the best way ever, because, you know, you'd go and see a band and then you'd be like, Oh, cool. Snot's playing an after party in this guy's basement. You're like, all right, cool. You know, but, uh, but that's kind of it. It's like, yeah, those, those scenes just aren't around anymore like that, but Back in well, the day, but I, but, I, but I also think that's why Straight Up worked out so well. Was because I think that was the culmination of of that scene in a way. You know, was was bringing the, in you, and, on it. yeah, you know, bringing you and Brandon and 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 um, uh, Mark McGrath and just I mean, it, it really did. It was like it was almost like the friendship album, you know, of, of all trip, the bands dude. that, that really. Yeah, the, of all cool the bands they had that. even had had PE on there. That's that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I mean, man. but I, I think you know, like you said, you and you and Lynn. I mean, Lynn was tight with everybody. That's what also yeah, made yeah. the record so good was that he. I mean, dude, I was a Zine kid in Jersey, and those guys would treat me like I was family when they would come out there. And I'm like, dude, I'm like 19, and I don't know any. Yeah. Like, why, why do you guys care? But Lynn yeah. always just made me feel super welcome. So it's like. <laughs> to know what that scene was like when you guys would play with him, you know, play shows and everything. I'm like, yeah, like that, that's, that's why that record makes so much sense the way it happened and the way everybody came together to be a part of it. You know, I thought that was, that really was, I think that was, that very much was the boat on the scene. Like you said, well, you know, it's cool for me um, to hear your perspective on it. Cause it gives me more of a, uh, more of an insight on how people see it. You know, because sometimes when you're just part of it, you don't really see what it's really worth. But, dude, you're so right. Um, man, it just captures um, that moment in time, you know. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I really did. You well, know. man, we've kept you for uh, yeah. a long time. I was yeah. like, yeah, we'll get 30 minutes with them. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, you guys are cool, man. It's been a, you know, I'm, I, like I say, I'm I'm uh, I'm a little bit antisocial, so getting together and hanging out with y'all and just having a chopping it up is, is good for my soul. So I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, well, next time you play the whiskey, hopefully I was trying to see if I could read when you're going to, when you guys are going to be in LA, but I can't really see it. Uh, but hopefully you'll be in LA soon. Yeah. You know, I don't think we'll be in LA till next year, but Ro, uh, you know what, Ro, if you could get my email from Josh, yeah. Mr. Toomey, then uh, I could talk to you about merch and stuff like that yep. too. Do it. Yeah. That would be super. Yeah, and I, uh, I do plan on being at the uh, Louisville show, so I'll be there on the 12th. Yeah, yeah. please come check in with me, yeah. Josh, and yeah. go ahead and um, uh, if you could just email me that, I'll go ahead and make sure that you're on yeah, the yeah. list, all that good stuff. Good, good, good. All okay. right. Um, well, once again, uh, Detox out December 15th. And uh, yep. you can pre-order now. And uh, this will be up before it. So make sure to check out on Tuesday, NotFest.com, for, uh, for the new single, new video release there. So that's good. Yes, uh, waiting. Lot, waiting. The official waiting. video. We're going on tour with Nonpoint. So stoked on that. Head PE hasn't had a support slot for ages. And our boys from Nonpoint called us up. And appreciate us going on tour with them. And I saw that point not too long ago, man. The energy in that show is going to be fucking off the hook, yeah. man. So shit's oh, going to be Yeah, fun. dude, and thanks to Notfest for, you know, supporting Head PE. That's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, dude. Thanks, Hi, guys. Jared. Well, thanks, man. Thank you very much, dude. Take care, bud. <laughs> All right.